Hi everyone, it's Angela with Broadhead Memorial Public Library back with our next episode of Have You Heard? We are continuing to read The Mouse and the Motorcycle by Beverly Cleary with illustrations by Tracy Doc Ray. We do want to give a quick thank you to Harper Trophy Publishers for allowing us to share this book with you this summer. Um, if you are enjoying these videos, make sure you like them below. You can also leave us comments and you can subscribe to our page and get notification of when we post new videos. All right, so let's recap where we left off yesterday. Um, Ralph lost Keith's motorcycle. That's where we kind of had started. Um, and the family, the mouse family, was worried because Keith had been bringing them room service um, to make sure they got fed. Uh, now, the na now they have a new worry is that uh, they overheard that the exterminators might be coming to try to take care of the mice in the hotel. All right, let's continue reading and find out what happens next. The next chapter is called An Anxious Night. At first Ralph's scheme worked. Keith delivered the promised bacon, toast, and jelly. The mice ate sparingly and laid aside the leftovers against the day Keith must leave the hotel. Ralph's mother continued to worry about tipping room service. I want to do the right thing, she insisted. There must be some way we could manage a tip. The mice dared not leave the nest to search for small coins that may have rolled under beds and dressers. It was late in the afternoon when Ralph heard Keith and his parents returning to their rooms very quietly so that his toenails did not make scrabbling sounds in the woodwork. He slipped to the knot hole and peeped out in time to see Keith flop down on the bed. Do I have to go down to the dining room for dinner? Keith asked his mother and father. I'm not hungry. Uh-oh, thought Ralph. There goes dinner. I told you not to eat that whole bag of peanuts so close to dinner time, said his father. I didn't eat all of it, said Ralph. That's good, thought Ralph. At least there would be peanuts for dinner. You'll feel better after you get washed up for dinner, said Mrs. Gridley. Hurry along now. When his parents had gone into room 216, Ralph noticed that Keith seemed to drag himself off the bed. He walked to the wash basin, turned on the cold water, moistened his fingers, and wiped them over his face. Then he turned off the water and gave the middle of his face a swipe with a towel, which he returned to the towel rack in such a way that it immediately fell to the floor. Keith did not pick it up, but, there was no but that was nothing unusual about this. Boys rarely picked up towels. What was unusual was that Keith returned to the bed where he sat down and stared at the wall. He did not play with his cars, nor did he eat the rest of his peanuts. He just sat there. Ralph stuck his head out of the knot hole. Anything wrong? he asked. Oh, hi, answered Keith listlessly. I sort of feel awful. Say, that's too bad, Ralph ventured a little further out of the knot hole. I know what you mean. Thinking about the motorcycle makes me feel awful, too. It's not that kind of awful, said Keith. I feel awful in a different way, sort of in my insides. Think you'll make it to dinner? asked Ralph. Oh, I guess so. There was no enthusiasm in Keith's voice. Anything I can bring you? Whatever's handy, said Ralph. Who hesitated to place an order when he could see Keith did not feel like going to dinner at all. We are sort of depending on you. The housekeeper found all those sheets I had to chew through to get out of the hamper, and I understand she got pretty excited about mice. We are laying low until the whole thing blows over. A smile flickered across Keith's face. Don't worry, I won't let you down. I saved you some peanuts. I thought they might be handy for storing. Gee, thanks, said Ralph. Keith got slowly off the bed and poked the peanuts one by one through the knot hole. When he had finished, Ralph popped out again and said, Thanks a lot. Keith smiled feebly and flopped down on the bed once more. Ralph went to work moving the peanuts away from the knot hole to make room for whatever dinner Keith brought. 
He felt it would be fun to be surprised by the menu this time. It was something of a shock to find that dinner, which was stuffed through the knot hole much earlier than Ralph expected, consisted of a couple of broken soda crackers. Ralph poked his head out to see if anything else was coming, but Keith was getting into his pajamas. "'Aren't you going to bed pretty early?' asked Ralph, realizing he had not heard Keith's parents come in. "'I felt so awful I couldn't eat, so they told me I'd better come up and go to bed.' Keith tossed his shirt on the floor, on, or excuse me, on the foot of the bed and pulled on his pajama shirt. When his head emerged, he said, I'm sorry about your dinner. It's the best I could do. All I had was a little soup. That's all, Ralph. That's all right, Ralph was beginning to be concerned. If the boy could not eat, neither could the mice. Keith fell into bed and Ralph ran off to report the news to his relatives. What a shame, said Ralph's mother. That poor boy. Oh dear, whatever shall we do, cried Aunt Dorothy. Our very lives depend on him. The little cousins huddled together, big-eyed and frightened. Yes, what about us? asked Mister. Asked Uncle Lester. How are we going to manage if he doesn't bring us our meals? It isn't safe for us to go out pilfering when the housekeeper has declared war on mice. I knew it was a mistake to depend on people, said Aunt Sissy. We'll manage somehow. We always have. Ralph's mother was trying to be brave, but Ralph could see how worried she was. After all, he did bring us a supply of peanuts. We should be grateful for that. He didn't bring many peanuts. Uncle Lester did not sound the least bit grateful. The greedy fellow was probably ill from stuffing himself with nuts when he should have saved them for us. Serves him right. Now, Lester, fussed Ralph's mother, the boy had a right to eat his own peanuts, but I do wish he hadn't been quite so hungry. Ralph returned to the knot hole. Keith was lying in the bed with his sports cars in one hand. How do you feel now? asked Ralph. Awful, answered Keith. Before Ralph could reply, footsteps in the hall warned him that Keith's parents were coming. He drew back inside the knot hole where he could observe without being seen. Mrs. Gridley paused by her son's bed and laid her hand on his forehead. He does feel a little warm, she remarked. He'll probably be all right in the morning, said Mr. Gridley. He just hiked too far in the sun this afternoon. I hope so, the boy's mother sounded less certain. Mr. Gridley filled a glass at the wash basin and brought it to Keith. Here, son, drink this. When Keith had drunk the water, he fell back onto the pillow and closed his eyes. His parents went quietly to room 216. When it was good and dark, Ralph ventured through the knot hole. He could hear Keith breathing deeply, and he knew that he was asleep. Since he had no one to talk to, he found his little crash helmet where he had hidden it behind the curtain, and after he had adjusted the rubber band under his chin, he climbed up to the windowsill to look out into the world beyond the hotel and to dream about the lost motorcycle. From his perch on the window cell, Ralph saw that the parking lot held more cars than usual. This meant that the hotels that the motels back on the highway were full of travelers were were full and travelers had followed the sign pointing to the Mountain View Inn. He could hear the holiday weekend activities in the halls too. People walking up and down, luggage being set with a thump on the floor, keys rattling in the locks. Gradually, as the night wore on, the hotel grew silent, more silent than usual for now. Even the second floor mice were quiet. There was no scurrying, scra scrabbling, or squeaking inside the walls. In the silence, Keith tossed in his sleep and mumbled something that sounded like motorcycle. In a moment, his mother slipped through the doorway, pulling her robe on over her nightgown. Ralph hid behind the curtain, peeping out just enough to see what was going to happen. She laid her hand on her son's forehead and murmured, Oh, dear. Almost at once she was joined by Keith's father, who was trying the belt, who was tying the belt to his bathrobe. What's the trouble? he asked. Keith has a fever, answered the mother. He's burning up. Ralph was shocked. The boy really was sick. It was not too many peanuts or too much hiking. The boy really and truly was sick. The father turned on the lamp on the bedside table, and he too laid his hand on the boy's forehead. Keith opened his eyes. I'm so hot, he mumbled. I want a drink. 
His mother pulled back the blanket while the father brought a glass of water and held it up to his son's head so he could drink part of it. Ralph watched an anxiously, but this time he was not selfishly concerned about the room service. He was concerned about Keith, the boy who had saved him from a terrible fate in the wastebasket and who had trusted him with his motorcycle. The boy who had forgiven him when he had lost that motorcycle and who had brought food not only for Ralph, but for his whole family. We had better give him, an asp give him an aspirin to bring down his temperature, said Mrs. Gridley. Mr. Gridley started towards room 216, stopped, and snapped his fingers as if, as if he had just remembered something. I took the last one back in Rock Springs, Wyoming, he said. I had a headache from driving towards the sun all afternoon. I meant to buy some more when we stopped, but I didn't think of it again until now. I should have thought of it myself, said Mrs. Gridley. I knew we were almost out. Never mind, I'll get some. Mr. Gridley picked up the telephone, listened, shook it, listened again, and said, That's peculiar. The line seems to be dead. They must disconnect the switchboard at night, said the mother, but surely there is someone on duty at the desk downstairs. Every hotel has a night clerk. I'll go find out, said the father, and he slipped out the door into the hall. I'm so hot, mumbled Keith. I'm so hot. His mother wrung out a washcloth in the cold water and laid it on her son's forehead. You'll feel better as soon as we get you an aspirin, she whispered. The minutes dragged by. What's keeping him, thought Ralph. Why doesn't he hurry? The old hotel snapped and creaked. Keith rolled and tossed, trying to find a cool spot on the pillow, and his mother wrung out the washcloth in more cold water. "'When's Dad coming?' asked Keith, his eyes bright and his cheeks flushed. "'In a minute,' soothed his mother. "'He'll be here in a minute.' "'I wish he would hurry,' thought Ralph. Still the minutes dragged. Finally, footsteps were heard in the hall, and Mr. Gridley returned to room 215. "'He's here with the aspirin,' whispered Mrs. Gridley to Keith. At last, thought Ralph, I thought he would never come. Mr. Gridley shook his head. There isn't an aspirin to be found any place. He sounded thoroughly ex exasperated. First of all, the night clerk was sound asleep on the couch in the lobby. I had a dickens of a time waking him up, and when I finally did manage to, he couldn't find any aspirin anywhere. Oh, no, exclaimed the mother. Oh, no, echoed Ralph's thoughts. What about that little gift shop off the lobby? asked Mrs. Gridley. It must sell aspirin. Locked up tight and the clerk went home with the key, answered Mr. Gridley. Oh, dear. The night clerk was really very nice about it, said the father. He even came up and looked in the housekeeper's office. How far is the nearest drugstore? Twenty-five miles back on the main highway, answered the father. And it does, and it closed at ten and doesn't open again until nine in the morning. The mother held her watch under the lamp, and it's almost one o'clock. It's hours until morning. She crossed the room to wring out the washcloth again. What will we do? What can we do? asked the father, helplessly. I even telephoned the doctor, but there has been a bad accident back on the highway, and he can't come. The night clerk said he would telephone the milkman before he starts his route at six and ask if he can bring some aspirin, but he won't get here until seven or later. All we can do is wait. Keith tossed under the cold washcloth. Mom, I think I'd like to go to sleep now, he muttered thickly. I guess that's all you can do, said his mother and bent over to kiss his hot forehead before she turned out the light. Ralph did not even wait for the boy's parents to leave the room. As soon as the light was out, he leaped silently onto the carpet, and by the time they had gone through the doorway to room 216, he had hidden his little crash helmet behind the curtain and was halfway through the knot hole. Somewhere, someplace in that hotel, there must be an aspirin tablet, and Ralph was going to find it. He only wished she had a motorcycle so he could travel faster. All right. Let's see. We will start reading the next chapter. It is called The Search. I have to go out into the hotel, Ralph informed his relatives. I've got to help the boy. Oh, no, no, not out into the hotel, cried Ralph's mother. Not while the housekeeper is looking for mice. If you're seen, we'll all be in danger. 
I'll be back before dawn, said Ralph staunchly. I must go. Don't try to stop me. See here, my boy. Aren't you being a bit dramatic? Asked Uncle Lester. Whatever do you have to go out into the hotel for? To pilfer a pill, said Ralph. An aspirin tablet. His answer was dramatic enough even for Uncle Lester. His entire family stared at him in dif disbelief. Not an aspirin. Not after his own father had been poisoned by one of those dreaded tablets. An aspirin? Ralph's mother gasped. No, Ralph, not that. Anything but that. It's the only way. Ralph stood tall and brave. The boy has a fever and he needs an aspirin. I'm going to find him one. Oh, Ralph. His mother hid her face in her paw. But, but Ralph, quavered Aunt Sissy. Remember your father? You can't carry an aspirin in your cheek pouches. It would be poison to you. How will you get one here? I'll find a way. Ralph was outwardly steadfast in his determination, but inside he wondered how he would manage to get an aspirin into room 215 if he did find one. Roll it, perhaps? Ralph, stay here, pleaded his mother. You're too young. Let your Uncle Lester go. Well, now let's talk this over, said Uncle Lester. I'm not too young, and I haven't a moment to lose. Ralph, who was r really frightened by what he was about to do, also enjoyed the drama of the moment. Goodbye. I shall return before dawn. Ralph, promise me you'll be careful, pleaded his mother. Promise me you won't climb into suitcases like your Aunt Adrian. Ralph's Aunt Adrian, who liked nice thing, had climbed into a suitcase to examine a nylon stocking. Someone had closed the suitcase, and Aunt Adrian had never been seen again. It was hoped she had been carried away to a life of luxury. Promise me, Ralph, cried his mother, but her son was already on his way out the knot hole. Ralph scurried across the carpet of room 215, flattened himself, and squeezed under the door. Once out in the hall, his courage ebbed. The aspirin tablet seemed a very small thing to find in such a vast place. It would be much easier to find the motorcycle. No, thought Ralph, I must not even think about the motorcycle. Ralph began to feel pretty small himself, much smaller than he had felt during his show of bravery back in the mouse nest. Down in the lobby, a clock struck one. There was not a moment to lose. He ran to the next room, squeezed under the door, and searched under the beds and the dresser while the two guests slept soundly. All he found was a bobby pin. He skipped room 211 because his enemy, the little terrier, was still there, and ran to room 209. A hurried search frightening frightening because of the loud and uneven snores that came from one of the beds, revealed nothing but a few pretzel crumbs, which Ralph did not have time to eat. On and on ran Ralph, down the hall, under doors, and around beds and dressers. There was not a single aspirin, ta aspirin tablet to be found. In one of the rooms, he did see a penny that had rolled under a, a luggage rack and remembered his mother's wish to leave a tip for room service, but tonight he had no time for pennies. He must press on and find an aspirin. A small doubt began to creep into Ralph's thoughts as he ran down the hall to the last room on the second floor. Maybe there was no aspirin. Maybe he was risking his life and the lives of his family for nothing. But Ralph pushed the thought aside. He would not let himself become discouraged. If there was no aspirin on the second floor, then there had to be one someplace on the ground floor. Tonight he was willing to brave the stairs to find it. He flattened himself and squeezed under the last door on the second floor. There was nothing under either of the beds but the things Keith had called dust mice. There was no sound but the rattle of the windows in the wind. Ralph started across the carpet toward the dresser when suddenly a light from the bedside table blinded him. He stopped, rooted to the carpet by fear even though it was not likely that anyone was going to cut off his tail with a carving knife. He heard someone slip out of bed and utter a sound halfway between a squeal and a scream. Before Ralph knew what was happening, an ordinary drinking glass had been clamped down over him, and there he stood, trapped in a glass. By then, his eyes were adjusted to the light, and he found himself looking at a pair of bare feet. Looking up, he saw the feet belong to a young woman in a pink nightgown. Mary Lou, wake up, she whispered to the young woman in the other bed. Look what I've caught. Huh? 
said Mary Lou, blinking and raising up on one elbow. Her hair was done up on pink rollers. Betty, are you out of your mind? It must be past one o'clock in the morning. The night was slipping by much too quickly for the trap mouse. He was terrified and he was desperate. No one in his family had ever been trapped under a drinking glass before. Worst of all, he was failing Keith and endangering his family. Wake up, Mary Lou, and look, insisted Betty. I was getting up to stop the rattle in the window and I caught a mouse. All right. Well, I think we are going to stop there for the day. Um, if you are participating in our summer reading program, you can go ahead and write down 20 minutes of listening time. We will be back tomorrow with more of The Mouse and the Motorcycle. All right. Have a fantastic day. Bye.